the second day. Calmness. Like yesterday, there was a storm outside. The hoarse roar of the wind hurt my ears. The sound filled me with a terrible melancholy. Having decided to stay as far away from the windows as possible, I was now sitting close to the door. But even that didn't bring me any peace of mind. The sound of the blizzard filled every nook and cranny of the room. Of course, it wasn't the weather's fault I was in such a dark mood. After all, an ominous situation was drawing very close. And here I was in the midst of it all. One could easily argue that feeling depressed was natural. It was just too much to think about. My brain couldn't operate fast enough to process everything, but I never once considered it giving up. Gathering my thoughts, I slowly went over my endless list of worries and troubles. I grappled with that mountain of challenges for four hours. I hadn't stopped thinking since waking up, and as my thoughts finally took sh shape, somehow noticed a means of escape. Before I describe it, I'll sort out the situation first. The various problems I'm facing can be roughly classified into four categories. A shelter cabin, my symptoms of DID and sphere, my amnesia, my near drowning in the bathtub last night. Now let's go down each thought pa path in order. Shelter cabin. Until yesterday I was convinced that everything that happened in the shelter cabin was just a dream. But it's different now. I no longer think that's the case. Perhaps the things happening there truly are taking place in the real world. Though I have no basis in this. It's highly detailed and well-constructed reality, or I directly felt felt cold and pain, and so on. I can easily make those simple claims, but that doesn't mean the evidence that that rea reality exists. Defining reality and fiction is an awfully hard thing to do to begin with. Then why did I come and think that it wasn't a dream? That's because I found another way to explain it. Let's begin from the conclusion. I definitely think I simultaneously experienced the time jump and personality exchange phenomenon. It's kind of a weak explanation, but I can at least use this as a basis for further reasoning. Firstly, the time jump phenomenon. In the shelter cabin, there were four people, Yumogi, Lin, Yuni, and the physical body of Kokoro. Three of them died on January 17th last year. The people who were supposed to be dead had appeared right in front of me. How can I explain this? Can I call them ghosts or something? No, that can't be right. They had substance, there's no doubt about that. They, who'd survived since the plane crash, had made it to the shelter cabin by struggling to get there with all their might. This fact lines up with the details reported later by the press. They survived until January 17th in the shelter cabin. Whilst from what they said, I know for a fact that the scene I saw was from January 11th immediately after the crash. If I had to make a guess based on the information, I have no choice but to think at that moment my consciousness jumped through time to the Mount of Cure of January 11th, 2011. Of course, that doesn't mean I can't completely throw away the ghost dream or delusion theories. But deep inside, I strongly feel that the world is real, it's tangible, it reacts. I just can't stop thinking about it. I jump through time, maybe. I don't know how somehow that could have happened. But right now, recognizing that I may have jumped through time was more important. To dismiss everything as a delusion or a dream is easy, but it's important to always keep the worst scenario in mind. That world, what if we assume that it's reality? With that in mind, the smartest thing to do in that case is to think about my next move. Now, next up is the personality exchange phenomenon. Since this overlaps with two, my symptoms of DID and Sphere, I'll move on to the next item. My symptoms of DID and Sphere. If what I saw at the shelter cabin is real, then it means that my consciousness is going back and forth between Mount Kuro and Asagi Island. My body at Mount Kuro was that of Fukara Kokoro. During that time I was there, what happened to my body back in Osaga? Let's start from the conclusion. That's Fukara Kokoro's consciousness was transferred into my body. When my consciousness possesses Fukara Kokoro's body in the shelter cabin, Fukara Kokoro's consciousness possesses my body in Sphere. When my consciousness goes back to my body, then hers con her consciousness also goes back into her body at the shelter cabin. Based on the testimony of the others that are both the shelter cabin and Sphere, that appears to be the case. That is to say, as I thought, I never had DID. I can say the same thing of both the shelter cabin and Sphere. I don't suffer from any, men any mental disorders. I was simply dragged from this baffling circumstances that could only be called a personality exchange phenomenon. However, even with that said, this isn't an easy case that can be settled simply by explaining it as a personality exchange phenomenon. This is because this unbelievably weird near supernatural phenomenon accompanies it, the time jump. Troubles, troublesome indeed, a nasty situation. How did this happen? I don't have the slightest idea what might have caused it. And since I don't know the cause, I don't know when the phenomenon will occur next, or when it will end. Though I will have a hunch, I have a hunch that it hasn't happened since last night. 
Perhaps while I was asleep, the time jump phenomenon, personality exchange phenomenon occurred. The time jump phenomenon plus um, personality exchange phenomenon hereafter I'll call it the exchange phenomenon. No matter how hard I thought about it, I didn't get anywhere. Time is of the essence in investigating the cause of all this, but right now there wasn't one thing I could do, like no clear target. But if the hypothesis of the exchange phenomenon holds true, then it'll make sense with the following events. I was familiar with the names Yumagi, Yuni, and Kokoro. This is because I remember the plane crash. Yumagi and Kokoro were discovered together with the decomposed body of Lim. Plus, the sole survivor Yuni may have been etched so deeply into my head that I couldn't forget him. I'll explain my amnesia in detail later. For now, my recollections of them seems to be due to the f above reason. Next, Uni. If the personality exchange theory is correct, then the enigma of Uni existing in both worlds is once is, tr is solved. Since the world of the shelter cabin is 2011 and this is 2012, it's not possible. It's not impossible. This is my guess. The only one not caught in the avalanche in January 17, 2011, Uni managed to escape death and turned up in Sphere a year later. The sole survivor of the plane crash, Kasuda Uni, I don't know why, why he came to Sphere. Where did he go and what did he do during that year? And even then, it's uncertain how he managed to get into Sphere. This isn't a facility that an outsider can freely enter and leave. The front gate is always shut tight and the wall surrounding it is full 7 meters high. There's no way you could just climb over it. But in reality, he's here. He, as if it, as if it were totally natural. The story I heard from Itsumi's last night suddenly came to mind. Kasuda Uni exists to exist. What does that mean? Include the matter of the terabyte disk, and it really makes me think that it's necessary to hear the details from Uni himself. 3. My amnesia. The current you, the one I'm talking to, is a special existence. One that gave its first birth, a cry, a mere 19 minutes ago. That's what uh, Itsami said. Itsami said that uh, yesterday evening. But in the end, that was all based on the assumption that I, you could have Satara, have DID. Now that the possibility of a personality exchange is seeing, seeming more and more likely, the theory that I have a DID is losing credibility. Nonetheless, my memory loss can't be explained with the personality exchange, so one of the world could be the cause of my amnesia. Did I take a blow to the head when I fell from the clock tower? I'm sure I can't explain it away as simply as that, but the most inexplicable part of it, even though I forgot most of the details about myself, is the fact that I can clearly remember the period when I was going out with Lin. The period when I was going out with Lin doesn't include the point at which our relationship began or ended. I don't know why we started going out or why we parted. Consequently, I don't even remember what happened after we went our separate ways. When I learned that Lin had died, was I sad? Did I cry? In the shelter cabin in 2011, when I got to see her again, I didn't think my lucky stars would jump for joy. Ordinarily, um, ordinarily, if I'd known she was alive, I'd be, it'd be natural for me to feel supreme joy at the news. But no such emotions came forth for me. Why? It's because while I was aware of the fact that she died, I didn't feel any sadness over having lost her. Of course, that's also because at the time when I still had no grasp of what was going on, I was confused. With my consciousness in a state of confusion, I guess I couldn't immediately link her existence to the plane crash. After waking up in Sphere, I filled it all the way in the corner of mind thinking it was a dream. But even so, it's very strange. This isn't ordinary amnesia. I really can't figure out what kind of rule that could that could be linking the things I remember with those I've forgotten. No, maybe that's not it. What if this isn't amnesia, but a memory transplant? For some reason I had that thought. 4. Almost drowning in the bathtub last night. Based on my hypothesis of the exchange phenomenon, I know it's Kokoro's consciousness that dove into the bathtub. While my consciousness was at the shelter cabin, Kokoro was controlling the unattended body of Yukido Sataru. But why did she? Was she trying to kill herself or something? After pondering for a while, there's no way. I discarded the bad idea as though shaking it off myself. Well then, if it wasn't a suicide attempt. Murder? Attempt to murder? Come to think of it, the sound of the door closing I heard back then. Could that have been the criminal running away? I don't want to believe it. I didn't, I didn't want to think about such a terrible thing. However, I can't help but consider the possibility, because I have no memory. I can't confidently declare I don't remember doing anything that could cause someone to resent me. Or perhaps without my knowledge, Kokoro's consciousness had committed some terrible act, and maybe my body had become the target because of that. Anyhow, I should ask Kokoro herself. Although, since I can't directly contact her consciousness, I need to find some way of getting in touch with her. Well, I'll think about that later. The points outlined above were what were what I spent four hours brooding over. Detentively lay it all out, it's like this. 
My mind and Kokoro's go back and forth, exchanging places with the other, between the shelter cabin of 2011 and the sphere of 2012. Uni, who safely returned alive from the frozen Mount Akura, turned up at sphere a year later. There was a possibility that my amnesia is in fact a memory transplant. Someone might have almost killed me last night. None of this went beyond the realm of pure speculation. I couldn't reach a conclusion. Conversely, I still couldn't deny any of those four possibilities. It's smart to th always think about the worst case scenario in advance, as I said before. While keeping those in mind, I reflected on what to do next. Well, I lost my purpose due to amnesia, but after coming here, I finally found some objections. They could be divided into the three broad categories below. Explaining the exchange phenomenon. I don't know when I'll jump to Mount Akur again, nor how long this phenomenon is going to continue. <sighs> Going and returning like this over and over for the rest of my life would be unbearable. Even if I put aside wondering at when the exchange is going to end, trying to figure out the root cause of it, cause of it was an urgent matter right away. 2. Saving the people in Mount Akura. According to the history I know, Yumoki, Kokoro, and Lin are going to be caught in an avalanche. I can't allow this to happen. Lin is, after all, my ex-girlfriend. Kokoro is, so to speak, my partner. The death of Kokoro could perhaps be my own death as well. I have to help Lin and Kokoro no matter what, and Yumoki too. We may have only just met, but nevertheless, I can't abandon him. Even if he is a complete stranger, there's no way I could turn, turn away and let someone else die in front of me. I'll protect them all for sure, and I'll show them that I can change history. Maybe this was the task entrusted to me. 3. Being wary of the people in Sphere. First of all, I have to investigate whether or not the incident in the bathtub really was really a murder attempt. Until I can clearly sort the guilt from the incident, I'm innocent. I need to watch out for people in Sphere. I don't like it, but I have to. In order to protect myself, I'll tell Kirker about this too. Since during the since during the time of the transfer, I'll have no way of knowing what's going to happen. So I have approximately three pressing tasks at hand. Seeing as I'm a, I'm at Sphere, I can't do anything about the Mount Akura situation. So I'll put the two put two on hold for now. That leaves one and three. But since I won't make any progress speculating about those things by all by myself, I've got to search for clues by talking with the other three here, especially Uni. Are you really a Mount Akura one year ago or not? If you were, how and why did you come to Sphere? What's written on the terabyte disk? How did you get hold of that disk in the first place? Those are the things I need to ask him. Moreover, I have to think of a way to exchange information with Kokoro. I've really got my work cut here. That was a long talk. Examine. I took my wristwatch out of my pocket. 11.03, it's still before noon. I decided to begin without delay. First of all, I'll start with this room. Examining my own room might help me find some clues regarding my amnesia. I'll... Ooh. Examine the desk. So I have to check out the desk. The objects are arrayed across it met my eyes. A notepad and a felt tip pen lay there. That's right, I can use this to reach Kokoro. If I left a message on this notepad, she could read or when the transfer occurred, and she could rely, re reply to me in the same way. As long as she left the note behind, then I'd be able to read it once I came back to Sphere. This is my room. No, should I say it's Kokoro's room too. Anyway, this is our private space, so whenever she was in the facility, she'd always come here. This somewhat old-fashioned means of communication isn't exactly what you call luxury, but for now I can't think of a better way. I took the pen in hand and immediately set about writing a message. What should I write about? After some hesitation, I put the pen back down. I hadn't heard any details from the three and sphere yet. It probably won't be too late to write a message later. If I wrote something unreliable, it'd only confuse her further. Leaving the notepad blank, I moved away from the desk. Next, I should examine the shelves. I decided to examine the shelves, the shelves at the foot of the bed. Lying next to the alarm clock were two things. The first was something like a card, and the other a small metal object. I picked up the card first. Oh! Satoru Yukido. 1331-2223-9801. This was engraved into the surface of plastic card. Yukido Satoru, my name. It looked like some kind of ID card. I turned the card over, but there was nothing worth describing on the back. My ID card? What was it used for? When, where, and for what? Come to think of it, Tsunami said this to me yesterday. You must have been a member of the staff. But I'm not sure anymore. Perhaps you've been a patient here from the start. So which one is it? St a staffer or patient? If I was a staff member, then this ID card was probably for you the use of Sphere personnel. If I was a patient, what then? It's not like it's strange for patients to have ID cards. Maybe this place requires all patients to carry an ID card. I don't understand. I decided to put the card in my pocket for now. Next, I picked up a small metal object. It was just a garden variety key. 
Two grooves were carved down in the center, and both sides had complicated patterns engraved into them. With just one glance, I could tell that it wasn't a key for a bike or any kind of automobile. It didn't seem to be the key to a drawer or safe either. It looked like an ordinary house key. It was a key that can't be described except with the word key itself. After picking it up, I took a look around me. First thing I thought of it thought of was that it could be the key to this room. Without further ado, I opened the door and tried to put the lock in the other side, but it didn't fit. Then it proved that this wasn't the key to the door. I hadn't noticed any other keyholes either. So what's this key for? Thus there too remained a hit mystery. I didn't understand what those items were for, but I decided to stop thinking about them for now. Put the key in the same pocket as my ID card. Next I examined the bed. Decided to check the bed. Remove the pillar and the covers. The white sheets were spotlessly fresh and clean. I spotted to look under the bed. Nothing, not so much as a scrap of litter. Just in case I decided to check under the mattress. I grabbed the edge and raised it high. Hmm, a magazine. A magazine had been hidden under the mattress. First I was flustered, thinking that its contents were probably indecent. Or maybe, or rather maybe it's not wrong to say I was hoping so. <laughs> but sadly it wasn't one of those magazines. Politics, economics, society, culture, entertainment, the week's current events and gossip topics, news, reviews, in other words, an ordinary weekly magazine. Current Events Weekly was written on the cover. And right below it, June 31st, 320 yen. The cover also included an illustration but didn't contain any writing. What year was this issue from? I picked up the magazine. After replacing the mattress, I sat down on the bed. Started to check the back cover. Along with the publisher, editor, and some other names, I found the following description. Issued on the 21st of the 7th, uh, 2011. It's from last year. Uh, 27th, that would be... July. Uh, the 7th would be July, I mean, so the 21st of July. It was about half a year ago. I tried flipping through the pages. A certain article caught my eye. How plane crash survivor finally found. So this is the where it came from, I'm guessing. That in, in itself was, wasn't particularly astonishing. I already knew what the headline had to be about. How about the contents? There might be some useful information in them. Thinking this, I scanned the article. To sum it up, the content, the control tower lost the plane's signal at about 3.30 p.m. on January 11th. The last known location was in the sky over the southern mountain range of Aomori Prefecture. <coughs> the police and related um, bureaus assembled a special rescue team and immediately commenced a search for the fallen airframe and the passengers. However, despite the ongoing investigations and searches, not a trace of the wreckage could be found. More precisely, the search lasted six days. For about a week, the state of the investigation remained unchanged. The whereabouts of the airframe are, as of yet, unknown. Even among the other plane crash incidents that happened in our country, this was an exception among exceptions, an unprecedented event. The sudden disappearances of Flight Hail 18 during the week before the airframe was found, Japan was in an uproar. Speculations flew, even including those that accredited the crash to something paranormal. It might have crashed into the Sea of Japan or been shot down by a fighter plane from a certain country. No, it was accidentally hit by, the, by a ground to air missile. Kidnapped by a UFO, swallowed into a different dimension, Flight 18 never existed in the first place, and so on. And of course, all these theories were mere speculations and all of them were wrong. The authorities would later explain the cause of the delay in the discovery of the airframe as follows. One, between the time the control tower lost sight of the aircraft and the time of the crash, there was a blink of over 30 minutes. During this time, Flight 18 appeared to have been flying at low altitude, weaving its way through the mountain range. Here with, the wreckage was found in a place far from the crash point predicted by the authorities. Nobody observed Flight 18's low altitude meandering. Flight 18 was making its way through a mountainous area in the dead of winter, a highly abnormal flight path. There were no private homes in the surrounding area, nobody around who could have heard the sound of the crash. Bad weather. Conflict conditions. At the time, the entire Mount Kakura area was constantly subjected to bad weather. Therefore, conducting an investigation was difficult. The effects of the solar winds, the most intense solar winds ever recorded in history, the disturbance resulted in the malfunction of the reconnaissance satellites. The use of satellite photography was almost impossible. Also impossible. The above was the official statement concerning the last week, the last week released by the authorities. Well then, on the contrary, how could the rescue team reach the side of the afternoon on the 7th? They simply said, we got a call. Early in the morning of the 16th, the authorities received a phone call from a man claiming to be a survivor of Flight 18. The gist of it was that there were four people in the shelter cabin on Mount Akura in need of rescue. Immediately after that, the call was cut off. 
Tracing the cola to its original, they found that the colorers had made use of a satellite phone line, but that line used by the satellite phone was also malfunctioning at the time due to the effects of the solar winds. The chances of getting a proper connection in the year 2011 was 1 in 1 million. Therefore, receiving a call from the survivors was an event that couldn't be described as anything short of a miracle. Incidentally, if not for that phone call, the authorities probably never would have been able to pinpoint the exact location of the cr crash in time. Anyway, after receiving the information, the authorities attempted to search the area by helicopter right away. But even so, from the 15th until daybreak on the 17th, the whole mountain crew was in the midst of a severe storm. They couldn't even fly the helicopter in that weather. The mountain rescue team could have gotten there on foot from the base of the mountain, but not without extreme difficulty. The shelter cabin was near the peak of Mount Akuro. No matter how skilled at climbing the team members were, in estimation it might have taken them a week or more to reach the cabin. In the end, there was no other option than to wait for the weather to improve. On the afternoon of the 17th, there was the break in the storm, and thus the rescue unit at last managed to arrive in the scene. This is the important part, if not the historical truth of the successful connection of the satellite phone on the 16th, then the rescuers would have never arrived on the 17th, and if that were so, the report of the discovery of the wreckage of Mount Kakura would have also been delayed. In other words, it's also like this. If the phone hadn't connected on the 16th, the rescuers wouldn't have arrived on the 17th, and the report would have been made, made later on. Well, if you were to ask me, so what, I'd have to ask you if that's about it, but... Anyway, this was somehow bothering me. I decided to file it away in the corner of my mind. The article continues. On January 17, 2011, 27 corpses, all from those among the 31st, 31 missing passengers and crew members, were discovered at the crash site. A single survivor was also found, Kasada Uni. Now, what about the remaining three? The man on the phone had said there were four survivors. If you include Uni, the number of people matches. The shelter cabin also contained evidence that several people had lived there for, four day for days. The authorities interrogated Uni about the circumstances of the accident. But Uni was in an unstable mental state and he remained obs obscenely st unsilent. Days later, the three were identified through the passenger list. Imogi Saiji, Fukara Kokoro, and Meizumi Lin. But their whereabouts remained unknown. Three of them suddenly vanished. It became a rich source of material for the mass media. Public speculation began to fly once more. Some of them were pretty far-fetched, and there were even those asking in the struggle over food. Did Uni kill the others and then bury them somewhere? Even in the face of scandals like those, Uni never broke his silence. They say that gossip lasts only for a season. Public interest gradually faded away as well. Time passed and July 3rd, 2011 soon arrived. The snow thawed and the mountain surface revealed the decomposed bodies of the three people. From here on, it was just the same as the newspaper I ran in the shelter cabin. At 6.53 on January 17th, 2011, the three were caught in an avalanche and passed away. The only difference was that the magazine article ended with these questions. How do they survive on Mount Kakura for seven days at such terrifying temperatures? Even if they knew that help was on its way, why and for what purpose did they leave the shelter cabin? Why, what did Kasuda Uni see during those seven days? What did he go through? Why, did he ref why does he refuse to speak around it even now? Is he hiding some truth that he doesn't want to reveal? Our investigation will get to the heart of the matter next week. Please look forward to it. <laughs> the article ended with these misleading words. What the heck, it ends there. I almost shouted at the magazine. Tch, clicked my tongue. Thinking that I might have missed something in the article, I flipped through the pages once more. Something fell off of that, um, fell out of the magazine with a swish. Bent over and picked it up. It was a plane ticket. Specifically, it looked like a boarding pass, but... It's for Sitaru. What? Um, what date? Hang on. I'm trying to look for a date... January 18th! 2011, on the far right. January 18th. Destination was Sydney Airport, Australia. <laughs> wow. The date of... Sorry, I live in um Australia. The date of departure was January 18, 2011, and the holder's name was Satara Yukuri. I'm Yugido. What does this mean? I was going to go to Australia a year ago? I don't remember that at all. No matter how much I think about it, it's unlikely I'll come up with an answer. I'll s I slipped the ticket back into the magazine. I returned to the magazine to its place under the mattress as well. I had no idea what was going on. Why had I happen hidden a six-month-old magazine and a ticket from a year ago in a place like this? I felt as if it were part of a plan thought up by someone hiding behind the scenes. I actually felt like someone had expected me to look under the mattress. No, perhaps that someone was really me before I lost my memory. My name was printed right there on the ticket. The mystery, the mystery kept getting more and more complex. There was no use in getting obsessed over it. 
I'll work on solely on solving the mystery of the magazine and the ticket eventually. As I thought that I decided that, I would now. I decided to examine the refrigerator. I opened the door. There were bottles of mineral water stored inside. Small 500 milliliter bottles. One of the three bottles, one had already been opened. It was about one third empty. The mineral water I drank yesterday came from the kitchen, so I haven't touched the bottle at all. Which means... Kokoro? Kokoro's consciousness was operating my body and may have drunk the water. Of course, there was also the possibility that I'd opened the bottle and drank some yesterday before I fell from the clock tower. Well, enough about the water. Everyone drinks water. There was nothing else in the refrigerator. I closed the door. Just in case, I looked on top of the refrigerator. Of the several glasses lined up there, one, only one was placed upright. Only a few milliliters of water was left inside. I probably drank the mineral water from the glass, but who cares about that? However, I didn't overlook the small silver fragment placed next to the glass. I picked it up. It was obviously a pharmaceutical package. The remnant of two pill package that was already open. The medicine itself was gone. Still, it's possible to understand something just from checking the package. Each tablet was around 7 to 8 millimeters in diameter. They appeared to be round. Needless to say, it was an orally administered medicine. I turned it over. When the torn fold where it was folded back into place, there pit beside the name of the pharmaceutical company was the following letters. Zegtaman. Zegtaman? An unfamiliar name. What kind of medicine was it? But even if I didn't understand the effects of the ingredients, there was no mistaking the that someone had taken it into my room. That's probably what the mineral water was used for. Now, who in the world had taken it? Was it me? Of course, I don't remember doing anything like that. But if it wasn't me, then maybe someone who was operating my body had drunk it. There was only one possible candidate. Kokoro. Kokoro most likely took them. I should definitely ask her about it. Nevertheless. I'd like to ask her to stop ingesting strange things while she's borrowing someone else's body. Like, if I didn't take them, you would die! Seriously, now. I returned the silver package to the top of the refrigerator as I muttered to myself. For now, I decided to file away in the medicine's name, Zagatman, in a corner of my mind. Next, no, there appears to be nothing left to examine. I've checked out all the things I had in mind. There weren't that many of them to begin with, so I don't think I've overlooked anything. Um, oops. The next thing I had to do was to talk to the other three people here in Sphere. I left my room.